Hi, I'm Lynn Hardy, and I want to welcome everyone today to this online Christian church special Sabbath service. We are gathered together. We don't do this often because we're an online church, but the Lord called us to gather, and we have been obedient to him. He has brought a very special message for the season that we are in. So let's begin. It was a custom in Israel to be baptized, to be fully submerged underwater as a sign of repentance. That was a physical demonstration stating that you were going to turn from that which our God says is sin. Let's look at that in the Bible. Matthew 3 verses one through five. This is the amplified classic version. In those days, there appeared John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness, the desert of Judea and saying, repent, think differently, change your minds, regretting your sins and changing your conduct for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. This is he who was mentioned by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, shouting in the desert, prepare the road for the Lord, make his highway straight and level and direct. This same John's garment were made of camel's hair and he wore a leather girdle about his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all of Judea, all the country around the Jordan went out to him and they were baptized by in the Jordan by him, confessing their sins. According to the ways of the people of our God, according to Israel, a necessary part of baptism is confessing that we have sinned. This is how Jesus's cousin, John, got the name John the Baptist, because he would baptize those who were confessing and turning from sin. This appearance of John was prophesied as a necessary pre preparation for God's people for, so that Jesus could come and they could receive him they, to, to get them prepared for his coming. You see, back then, before Jesus came the first time, it was necessary for the people to turn from certain things because Israel's leaders had stopped teaching God's ways and the people were in sin. But God had a solution. He sent someone to get his children ready for the prophesied Messiah. That was John the Baptist. Now, just like Jesus is our lamb, the lamb of God, for sacrifice for our sin, Israel had a lamb they sacrificed every year for sin. And their sin didn't stop them from being one of God's people. Just like our sin doesn't make us no longer God's children once we take Jesus as our Lord, once we are Christians. However, even sacrificing that lamb, a baptism of repentance was necessary. Many Christians need to be taught not only about what is sin and what is not and what our God expects of us, but the need to turn from it because sin actually separates us from Jesus and from God. It keeps us from receiving all that he has for us. So let's look at that in the word of God. John 1, 31, the Amplified Classic Version. And I did not know him and did not recognize him myself, but it is in order that he should be made manifest and be revealed to Israel, be brought out where we can see him, that I came baptizing with water. The purpose of the baptism of repentance was so people could recognize and receive Jesus, receive all that God had for them through his son. That baptism of repentance cleared away the blockage that sin had built up. Even though Jesus is no longer on this earth, 
he still wishes to make himself known to you, just like he did to Israel. Jesus confirmed, or John confirmed this when he received a prophecy about Jesus and his second coming. You see, there is a church in the book of Revelations called the Laodicea Church, and it is lukewarm. They are not on fire for God, but they're not completely cold either. They're somewhere in between. And Jesus tells them that if they will turn from the, their sin of not really acknowledging him, right? When you're lukewarm, you're just kind of coasting along. Yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah, no big deal. But you're not really focused on Jesus as your Lord. And so God said when they would turn from that and learn his ways and apply them, and that they could recover their zeal for God, and there would be fabulous benefits. So here's what happens when you repent, when you turn from your sin. It says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him and he with me. This is a fabulous, wonderful promise from our God. You see, in ancient Israel, a meal time was a time of fellowship and of sharing. Do you desire Jesus to be as real to you as if he was joining you for dinner, as if he was a regular dinner guest? Then an action is required. If you aren't experiencing this, you may need a baptism of repentance. Now, this applies to all of God's children, not just a Laodicea type church. If you are not experiencing God, perhaps there are some things that you need to turn from, some behaviors. Perhaps you need to declare you're going to try and get close to your God. A baptism of repentance is what you need. See, in John 17, verse 24, this is the English Standard Version. It says, Father, I desire that they also whom you've given to me, that they may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundations of the world. This was the longest prayer in, it was part of the longest prayer Jesus prayed before he ascended to heaven. Jesus asked his father that you, that all of you could be with him where he is. And where is he? He is in heaven. He wants to visit with you face to face. To learn more about that, please see the classes in the narrow path called the secret place. So we'll just leave that right there. But if that is a desire of yours, if you have not experienced this, then perhaps you may need a baptism of repentance. After you are a Christian, another reason to experience a full submersion baptism or repentance is to make the declaration that you are turning from sin. Confessing individual sin or may not be necessary, whatever the Holy Spirit brings, it may just be a general acknowledgement that you have sinned. And if we look into the Old Testament, the prophet Isaiah showed us that there is a consequence for sin. We may not lose our salvation every time we sin, but we have consequences. So let's look at that now. Isaiah 59, 1 through 4, then we're going to skip down to 7 to 9. Isaiah 1, 59, 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened at all. It cannot save, nor his ear dull with deafness that he cannot hear. But your iniquities, that's continued and repeated sin, have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you. So he will not hear you for your hand. So let's stop right there for a second. Okay. So do you feel like your prayers are just kind of hitting the roof and coming back down? Are you not able to connect with God? Is he not answering your prayers? It may be because there's sin standing between you and God. And so now Isaiah is going to go on to list a few of the things of that, that Israel was sinning about. It says, for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongues mutter wickedness. 
many of you have a problem with sometimes you speak things that you shouldn't? Don't worry, we have a class for that in the online Christian church. But our words are important. It says here, if you're if you're talking wickedness, that can be a sin separating you bef- between you and God. It says, none sues or called in for righteousness, but for the sake of doing injury to others, to take some undue advantage. In other words, you're looking for your own advantage. You're not really looking for righteousness, not to be right in a matter. No one goes to law honestly and pleads his case, case in truth. They trust in emptiness, worthlessness, and futility, and speaking lies. They conceive mischief, mischief and bring forth evil. These are strong words, but if you actually look at it, there's a lot of truth in this world today. What is worthless and futility? You know, there's so many, so much lies in general in the world. We'll skip down to seven and it says their feet run to evil and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity, of sin, of desolation and destruction are in their paths and highways. The way of peace they know not. You're not trying to be peacemakers is what God calls his sons and daughters. You're doing the opposite of that. You don't know how to bring peace to a situation. There is no justice or right in their doings. They have made them into a crooked path. Whoever goes in does them not and knows not peace. Therefore, are justice and right far from us and righteousness and salvation do not overtake us. You see, God cannot bring justice and righteousness to and salvation to you. You cannot be removed from that which is attacking you if, if you still remain in sin. We expectantly wait for light but only see darkness for brightness. But we walk in obscurity and gloom. Does this sound like your life? Are you walking in darkness and gloom and you can't see the the light? You see, God is all powerful and nothing is too hard for him. The reason our prayers are not answered is not because God is unable to help us. Continued and repeated sin keeps God from hearing our prayers. So it seems like they're unanswered. Remember Jesus, Jesus is called the light. Our sin can keep us from seeing Jesus, connecting with him and all that he has for us. I know this is Old Testament. So let's go to the New Testament and confirm that this is still God's way. John 14, 13 through 15, Amplified Classic Version. And I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am. So my father may be glorified and extolled in and through the son. Yes, I will grant, I myself will do for you whatever you ask in my name as presenting all that I am. If you really love me, you keep and obey my commandments. So guess what? We don't get whatever we ask in Jesus' name unless we're willing to obey Jesus as our Lord. If you are not obeying him, then asking in his name is going to do zero good. Not only that, are you asking for God's glory? It says that the Father may be glorified. Are you doing it for your own glory, for your what you want? Or are you doing it for God's glory? To receive from Jesus, we must love him. Loving him means obeying obeying him. If we purposefully continue in behavior, we know he has not told us to do, then we are not really submitted to him as our Lord. In fact, in biblical terms, to purpose purposefully disobey God and Jesus is to hate them. This is from the New Testament, John 3, 19, 19 through 21, Amplified Classic Version. The basis of the judgment, the indictment, the test which men are judged, the grounds for the sentences, the judgments against them, lies in this. The light has come into the world and people love the darkness rather than the light for their works, the deeds, their actions were evil. For every wrongdoer who hates and loathes and detests the light 
will not come out into the light, but shrinks from it, lest his work, his deeds, his activities, his conduct be exposed and reproved. Are you hiding sin in the darkness where no one can see it? Well, guess what? God sees it and he will not take you to the next place. Let's, let's look at what the benefits are. But he who practices truth, who does what is right, they come into the light. And so his works may be plainly seen and shown what they are. They're wrought with God. They're divinely prompted, done with God's help and dependence upon him. Those are the righteous deeds. Where are you in this? Have you begun to learn God's ways? Do you even know what God and your Lord Jesus expect of you? We must learn his ways and practice them. Then we won't continue in sin. Because when we do that, we are agreeing with God's enemy, Satan. We are siding with him. If you're doing what's sin, that's what God told us not to do. And that's what the enemy wants you to do. This is why continued disobedience is considered hating God. Because you're actually working against him. If we're doing this, we cannot expect God's help. Unless we are willing to turn from our sin, that means to repent. That's what repent means. We cannot get his help. But there are some awesome benefits if we do. Let's look at more benefits. Because God is good and he loves you. He wants what is best for you. John 14, 21 through 24 the person who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who really loves me and whoever really loves me. This is Jesus speaking. The one who really loves me will be loved by my father and I too will love him and I will show, I will reveal, I will manifest myself to him. Do you want Jesus to be clearly seen? Do you want him to manifest and make himself real to you? Are you willing to love him and obey his commandments? Now, Judas, this is um, verse 22. Judas, not Iscariot, not the one who betrayed Jesus, but the other one, asked Jesus and said, Lord, how is it that you will reveal yourself and make yourself known to the world? So how, how is God going to manifest himself to you? Jesus answered, if a person really loves me, he will keep my word and obey my teaching and my father will love him and we will come and make our home, our abode, our dwelling place with him. Anyone who does not really love me does not observe and obey my teachings and the teachings which you hear and heed are not mine, but it comes from the father who sent me. You see, this is one of the most important ways you can know right now if you need a baptism of repentance. Has the Father and the Son come and made their home, their abode with you? Have you seen them? Have, have they manifested themselves to you fully? If you're not sure about how this, what this means, there's a free book called The Secret Place, How to Visit with Jesus. We'll show you many different ways God manifests himself to you. Now, Paul, Paul, you know, the guy who wrote like half of the New Testament, Paul makes it clear. We are expected to learn and apply the basic principles of God's ways before we can receive any benefits from our salvation. Let's look at that scripture. This is Hebrews 5, verse 11 through 13, ESV. Concerning this, we have much to say, and it is hard to explain since you have become dull and sluggish in your spiritual hearing and disinclined to listen. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, because you've, beca because you've had time to learn the truth, learn about God, but you actually need someone to teach you again the elementary principles of, from God's word. From the beginning, you have to start all over. Because you have become continually in need of milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is doctrinally inexperienced and unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a spiritual infant. You see, we are 
can, no matter our age, our physical age, no matter how long you've been a Christian, you are considered an infant until you spend time and energy learning and applying God's ways and his principles to your life. Otherwise, you are still a baby and you might have to start all over again learning about God. Also consider, if you're not willing to learn God's ways, is Jesus truly your Lord? The word Lord means owner, master. We are considered bond servants to Jesus. A bond servant was someone who sold themselves into slavery to someone who paid their debt. See, Jesus paid the debt we couldn't pay. He was crucified and tortured and, and for our sins. He paid that debt. And so now we are his servants. Are you his servant? Or did you just say a prayer and then move on with your life? Jesus has said that it is time for those who are really his people to turn from that which is sin. He said it is time that the fiery serpents are loosed among his people. So let's look at that in scripture and see what God is doing at this moment. Numbers 21, four through five, or four verse five in the Amplified Classic says, and they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient, depressed, much discouraged because of trials of the way. And the people spoke against God and against Moses and said, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no bread, neither is there any water, and we loathe this light, contemptible, unsubstantial manna. So remember, manna was that thing that God miraculously rained down from heaven every day. All they had to do was go and gather it up, and they had substance, everything they needed. Their clothes didn't wear out. They didn't, <laughs> they didn't um, wear, even, we even wear out their shoes. God miraculously pro provided for them but the manna was a miracle from heaven. So there are so many direct correlations in this scripture. Let's look at it step by step. Life for many Christians is no different than the rest of the world. It is full of struggles. They are depressed, they are discouraged. It feels like stuff is going wrong. That is the state of most of Christianity. But God, miraculously provided manna for his people in the desert. But they thought little of it after having it for some time. They ate it for years. And after some time, they got tired of it. And they just kind of thought little of this big miracle God was doing. Well, guess what? God sent his son, Jesus. And he is the miracle, the provision for all of us. Yet, how many people take it lightly? And they're like, yeah, I'm a Christian. No big deal. They are, they are disparaging the miracle of God dwelling among us and all that he's done. In the desert, the Israelites began to long for Egypt. And metaphorically speaking, well, literally speaking too, Egypt was symbolic of sin. Because in Egypt, there were other gods and they were full of sin. You know, God had to write the Ten Commandments to teach them his ways again. And they long to go back to that. Most Christians no longer feel the need to be different from the rest of the world, from Egypt. Matter of fact, if you tell them there are certain things they should be different doing, they don't like that. You see, they have forgotten that we are to be holy unto God as he is holy. And what holy means, it means separated from so many Christians have just gone right back to Egypt, right back to sin. They have not worried about God's ways. They have not worried about even learning truly and applying it to their lives. This is the state of the body of Christ. What God did that did then, Jesus is saying is happening now. Numbers 20, 21, 6. What happened when, when, they were, when they were unhappy about the manna and they were whining and complaining? Guess what? The Lord sent fiery, burning serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and that many Israelites died. 
God remains the same. He loosed fiery serpents after giving his people time to turn from their sin and learn their ways. And he's doing it again. Christians may find themselves bitten, meaning they are afflicted, even some unto the point of death. So what happens when you are being afflicted? When your finances are under attack, your emotions are, your health is, your family is, what should you do? How do you respond to the fiery serpents? Verse 7 in Numbers 21, we're going to do, read 7 through 9. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned. See, they acknowledge they sin. First step, acknowledge you have sinned. For we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he may take this away from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent of bronze and set it on a pole. And everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of bronze, put it on a pole. And if a serpent bit any man, when he looked at the serpent of bronze, attentively, expectantly, with a steady, absorbing gaze, he lived. This is the season we're in. The bronze snake represented their sin. So you must know what that sin is. We, you must be understand that you have sinned. Then they have to confess. You have to confess, oh God, I did wrong. And that then Moses made that symbol of the sin and put it on the pole. And in order to be removed from that affliction, you had, couldn't just go and look at it. Oh yeah, please forgive me, I sinned. Oh no, that wasn't what God said to do. He said to look absorbing at it. Absorbing means intensely interested, engrossed in it. They had to be attentive to it. This is the way you must look at what it, the Lord, if you want the sin to be removed. Why do you have to look at the Lord that way? Look, let's look what John said. John, the one whom Jesus loved, not the Baptist, said this. John 3, 14 through 15. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the son of man be lifted up that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Now that word believe, I don't have it in my notes, but I know that in, Pat, in the past I've looked it up and it means to trust in, rely upon, lean upon. It means to engrossly look at. You see, for our, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, it says, for our sake, he made Christ virtually to be sin who knew no sin so that in and through him, we might become the righteousness of God. And that righteousness of God means we ought to be approved and acceptable and right relationship with his goodness. So we must look at Jesus and all he did upon the cross. We must look at our sin and know that he has taken care of it. He died once and for all. He was nailed to the cross for the sin that would occur at all times. But you have to be willing to run to the cross and ask to be forgiven, knowing what that sin is. And just like with that snake on the pole, you have to look intently, steadily, being willing to absorb it into your life, what Jesus has done. Now, remember, according to John 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning, before all time, was the Word, Christ, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God himself. Jesus is the Word. If you're looking at Jesus, one way is looking at the Word. You must be willing to run to the Word of God and learn where you missed it. Ask Jesus. He'll tell you. he say, Jesus, I know I'm afflicted. Reveal to me. Where I'm out of alignment. Why did I get bitten? That is what you have to do. The first step for many will be a baptism of repentance, just stating, gosh, I'm afflicted. I'm not, I know I am not done right. I know I am wrong. I know there's a fiery serpent in my life, but Jesus, you are able. Jesus, I'm going to turn from whatever I see is wrong. I'm going to rededicate myself to you. I'm going to declare I'm turning and repenting from sin. 
the final reason, the final reason God gave me for each and every person who desires a baptism of repentance to receive it is this. We can see it in the life of our Lord. Before Jesus entered into ministry, he was baptized by his cousin John. Remember, baptism is to turn from sin, but Jesus was without sin. So why was he baptized? Well, let's look at, at his baptism first. Matthew 3, verses 13 through 17, Amplified Classic Version. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. But John protested strenuously, having in mind to prevent him, saying, it is I who have need to be baptized by you, but you come to me? But Jesus replied to him, permit it just now, for it is fitting, it is a fitting way for both of us to fulfill all righteousness. It is to perform what is completely right. Then he permitted Jesus to be baptized. And when Jesus was baptized, he went up once out of the water and behold, the heavens were open and John saw the spirit of God descending upon him like a dove and alighting on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, this is my son, my beloved in whom I am delighted. You see, Jesus was without sin. That is true. But Jesus was born in Israel. He was circumcised by the Sadducees and the Pharisees. He was dedicated in, their in the temple. This would have placed Jesus under the corrupt religious leaders. Throughout the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, we see both Jesus and John and others referring to the Sadducees and the Pharisees as vipers. Matthew 12, 22 through 24 and verse 34. Then a blind and dumb man under the power of demon, a demon was brought to Jesus and Jesus cured him. So the, the blind and dumb man both spoke and saw. And all the crowds and people were stunned and bewildered and one in wonderment and said, this, can this be the son of David, can it? But the Pharisees hearing it said, this man drives out demons by the help of Beelzebub, the prince of demons. Then Jesus, after a little discourse said, you offspring of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil and wicked for out of the fullness and the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks? You see, in according to Israel, only the Messiah could heal somebody who is both deaf, deaf and mute. Only the Messiah could do that miracle. And the Sadducees and Pharisees didn't want a Messiah. They liked being in control. So they accused him of doing it by the power of the enemy. Such corruption. When Jesus appeared on the earth the first time, Israel had fallen so far from God's ways. The spiritual leaders were not holding or to them, nor teaching others about them the way they should. When Jesus healed on the Sabbath, instead of rejoicing that somebody was set free, they accused him of working with the devil. If you have come under spiritual leadership that are not walking in God's ways, then you may do as Jesus did and have a baptism of repentance, separating, separating yourself from all past leaders. Now, you're not going to have to name every leader or every action every time they did something, but you'll know in your heart what you're confessing. It's your heart that God sees. Jesus didn't stand there when he was being baptized and rebuke and call out the Sadducees and Pharisees. Nope. He just received the baptism. baptism. It's your heart that matters. So if you are willing to learn God's ways, and when you see it in scripture, and you know that the word of God says this, you must be willing to turn from any sin, any traditions, any wrong teachings, even prayers or prophecies that have been said over you that you discover are not lined up with God and his word. If you're willing to do this, you can receive a baptism of repentance. You can renew your relationship with God so you can see Jesus. This is what he wants to do at this time. He wants to manifest himself to his people, but they have 
been lost in sin. Sin stands between them and God. And that is his message for you today. He gave these words to me concerning the baptism. This is Jesus speaking and not me. He said, have the people confess their sins so that I may re be revealed to them in whatever way I choose. I hold the key of David. I will decide, not them. Be willing to receive whatever God has for you. Lord willing, it'll be a face-to-face -face visit. But however he begins to manifest, we will teach you about that in the free online classes, the different ways so you can acknowledge and rejoice and come to know your God more. That is our message for today. That is what the Lord has said. That is what our Lord wants. That is his desire for his church at this time.